Is Israel's global power growing or is it on the wane? Well, it depends where you're talking about. It's power over the state in the Western world is clearly growing because the state is cracking down on an unprecedented level on voices of dissent to the Israeli and the allied Western state policy towards what's happening in Gaza. I've just met Sarah Wilkinson. I won't tell you how I met her because she's on bail and the conditions are that she's not allowed to use the telephone or the internet, not allowed to open a computer. This is a 61-year-old, respectable British activist who has never put a foot wrong, never broken the law, never been in trouble, but because she's been speaking out online against Israeli crimes, she was swooped on by no less than 12 of Britain's finest police officers, some of them wearing balaclavas, some of them from the anti-terrorist squad. For a 61-year-old British lady accused of tweets that offended Israel. You couldn't make it up. Unfortunately, you don't have to. You only need to know what I've just told you. You only need to know what happened to Richard Medhurst, another frequent guest of mine, arrested in handcuffs at Heathrow Airport. He was taken incognito, incommunicado. Nobody, neither his parents, his lawyer, his hosts in England knew where he was, or even if he was alive or dead. Kit Clarenberg, another British journalist, guest of ours, arrested at Luton Airport, held for hours, all his journalistic tools, his devices taken from him. Never mind that, the Honorable Craig Murray, a former British ambassador turned journalist, was similarly treated by the police at Edinburgh Airport and is still on bail. Can you believe it? No charge, still on bail, still hobbled. Well, that's the point, of course. Now, whether Israel sent a memo to the British police, to the British government, asking for a stepping up on the harassment of free speech and free thought, in Britain is immaterial. Either they did send a memo or the British state didn't require a memo to discern what was the best way to respond to the mounting anger in Britain and in all Western countries to the Netanyahu narrative. And when you lose the battle of the narrative, when you lose the ability to win the argument, the only weapon left is to shoot the messenger. Hopefully not yet literally shoot the messenger, just cut the messenger off from being able to deliver their message. Everyone, even me, is subject to algorithmic strangulation, no platforming, shadow banning, and all of the paraphernalia that they use short of arrest to try and suppress the message that we are suppressing, that we are putting out, suppressing our ability to talk to the public without having to be strangled by the filters at their disposal. And the reason they need to do that is that we have won the argument. Nobody now, no respectable person now, can possibly take to a public platform and justify what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Bethlehem, what's happening in the West Bank and in occupied Jerusalem. Nobody could do it. So what's the alternative but to shut up those of us who have won the public relations battle about the true nature of Netanyahu's apartheid state? Question is, is Israel's power growing or is it on the wane? 
Let's meet our guest today, one of the world's top journalists. See what he thinks. This is Have It Out with Galloway. Afshan Ratansi is a British journalist, but he's truly global. He is one of the world's most important free journalists, free voices. He's the host of an independent production, Going Underground, which is being broadcast and indeed eagerly awaited around the world. And he joins us now. We're privileged to have you, Afshan. Thank you for joining us. Um, I've just adumbrated a number of celebrity uh, occasions in which prominent British voices have been seized, literally seized by the state, put in irons by the state, which is an indication uh, that they are having traction amongst the public, but it's an indication also, isn't it, that the governments of the West are losing control of the arguments, not just around Gaza and the West Bank, but also Ukraine and other international conflicts. What do you say? Yeah, George, it's been a, a long time coming, hasn't it? Over the course of the 20th century, the late 20th century, we saw one journalist, one newspaper, one broadcaster after another censored repeatedly. I remember John Pilger telling me, the late John Pilger telling me, how often the British broadcast regulator would try to censor his documentaries. This has been going on for a long time. Now, of course, it's become desperate as they try and seize... Uh, you mentioned Sarah Wilkinson, uh, this uh, great uh, journalist who has alerted, uh, I'm sure, you as well as me with her tweets to uh, oncoming news, more and more yeah, immediate news about the horrible massacres in Gaza that we're seeing at the behest of British European Union and American uh, weaponry. So it's been a long time coming. Now they get more and more desperate. I, I actually thought maybe the next stage, as they realize they're losing, is to, um, and maybe Britain started it earlier, closing down all the libraries. Maybe the important thing next for Western European nations acting as vassal states for the United States will be to reduce money for education under the guise of austerity so that people and publics won't even understand how to read and even understand arguments. Maybe that's the next stage of the mind control and totalitarianism of Western Europe, uh, which we're seeing so on display with regard to what um, even uh, the International Criminal Court or whatever uh, believes is plausible genocide. Well, uh, I'm so old, I remember the International Criminal Court uh, calling for arrest warrants against Netanyahu. I'm so old, I remember the International Court of Justice, the highest court in the world, we were told, giving a devastating judgment uh, on Israeli crimes and issuing orders uh, to the state of Israel uh, to cease and desist and to vacate their illegal occupation uh, of uh, the West Bank, Jerusalem, Gaza, uh, the Golan Heights, and so on. I, I, I'm so old, I distinctly uh, remember nothing happened about that. So the question I'm posing, really, is Israel's power growing or is it on the wane? What's your take? Yeah, actually, the International Criminal Court uh, Chief Prosecutor, Karim Khan, was on my show going underground, and YouTube has taken it down. <laughs> I don't know what he has to say about that. I can't actually remember what the interview is about, but, it, you know, it's known as the International uh, uh, Caucasian uh, Court, clearly, except for when it was uh, uh, acting as NATO's uh, best buddy over the destruction of Yugoslavia, uh, apart from all the um, indictments of uh, black African leaders daring to defy the World Bank and the IMF. Israel's, um, Israel's power, I suppose, lies in, uh, in the nuclear weapons. And uh, we, both of us remember, again, it was a case of censorship as they 
as they um, took poor Mordecai Vanunu, who illuminated uh, to the world the presence of nuclear weapons in Israel. Israel desperately trying to drag the uh, Biden-Harris uh, administration into uh, a wider war. Iran, um, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, all the neighboring countries being very careful not to do the bidding of what uh, Israel wants it to do to draw in the Biden-Harris uh, regime. But I mean, I have a, something here from uh, from this woman, Kamala Harris, her statement on the release of these uh, uh, dead uh, prisoners that were taken on October the 7th, killed presumably by British, American and uh, United States weaponry. And it reads like uh, it's straight from Netanyahu. And no mention of even this um, absurd uh, hostage uh, deal that's been on the table that Blinken has the nerve uh, to talk about. It's literally just Hamas are evil, kill them all. So Israel clearly have their uh, complete control over Washington, they have complete control over RFK Jr., over Tulsi Gabbard, over Donald Trump, over Kamala Harris, over the DNC, over the RNC. And given Western Europe is just uh, just a marionette uh, part of a continent, they will do their bidding. Um, I mean, what? We're down to Tucker Carlson, really, and his ability to persuade the Biden-Harris regime or the, uh, more importantly, the Trump uh perhaps next presidency. No, Israel have a lot of power. Uh, its only waning power is to do with the words at the UN Security Council coming from uh, permanent members Russia and China. Words so far. It is, though, down to the naked bones of hard power, isn't it? Do you agree that they have lost their soft power dominance? I mean, I lived in a time in the uh, early part of my work on Palestine, I distinctly remember the uphill battle it was to persuade people about the true nature of the Zionist regime. Even people in the labor movement, even people on the left of the labor movement, there was still this miasma, this uh, idealized idea of the histadrut, the kibbutzim, and uh, and uh, the you know free love and all of that, it had uh, an attraction for progressive people at that time in the 1970s in the world, even more in the 60s, but still well into the 70s. It doesn't have that allure anymore, does it? The truth is, their power all. is all fire and and lead. That's all gone, yeah, and uh, good riddance to it, because the picture's coming across social media, and we have, of course, the internet to thank for that, despite the censorship of oligarchs uh, in the US system. Uh, that That's all gone. But then you look at even this week, there's something called the Mercury Prize from uh, musical bigwigs, because, of course, it's culture, that Israel has tried to control the APAC uh, lobby and Israel uh, allied powers. And I'm looking at who's up for the top album of the year. You won't have heard of these people, I know. Barry, I bet you're a fan of Dylan. I think he has a house in uh, Israel, doesn't he? Barry Can't Swim, uh, completely pro the proxy war against Russia through Ukraine. Um, the Last Dinner Party says something about Gaza, CMAT. It's a minority of bands saying something about them, but presumably they'll lose the awards. You know, you're not going to get Taylor Swift talking about genocide and Gaza, even though she was spotted coming out of some sort of uh, conceivably pro-Palestinian uh, occasion in New York, I understand. So um, despite the fact they've lost the argument in that way, culturally, they still will be able to come out with those films and movies and music and an art, because, uh, you know, can you imagine uh, can you imagine an artist really coming out against, uh, against what's happening in Gaza, a new and up-and-coming artist, let alone a mainstream one? You're not going to get any many actors. What, Mark Ruffalo? There are not many actors, not many musicians, not many cultural icons who will dare uh, break the totalitarian ceiling, even when it comes to what this international criminal court calls plausible genocide. 
Maybe Taylor Swift was innocently eating a watermelon and it has been misinterpreted uh, by the other side. But it is an important point you're talking about. And she's on. a billionaire. She's a billionaire. She has yes. the money. I mean, how much she money has the do money you need? To do it. But how much money do you need? That's a question I ask an international musical superstar uh, a decade or so ago in this context. I won't name her for uh, fear of further embarrassment to her. But the, the someone asked me on the show... Uh, there the is Roger week. Waters, though. I should just quickly say there is Roger Waters, whose birthday There's Roger is Waters and there's Eric Clapton, and both are saints in my eyes, but both of them are over 80 years old. Where are the new generation of peoples? Someone asked me on my show the other day, why can't we have a live aid for Palestine? And, of course, the truth is, uh, Bono and Bob Geldof and the movers and drivers of the Live Aid phenomenon are, are all on Israel's side. And new artists, as you've just indicated, are afraid for their career to place themselves firmly in the anti-genocide camp. That's quite a comment on the state of our society, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine Oasis, who uh, thought Jeremy Corbyn was some kind of communist? Can you imagine Oasis? No wonder Oasis are being plugged so widely on uh, so-called uh, mainstream legacy media, because Oasis say nothing. They, uh, this is the kind of culture of Western Europe that is being uh, actively promoted, and that's those are the rules. And that's why culture is dying in Western Europe, as they ban uh, Tchaikovsky and who knows what else as part of the proxy war on Russia through Ukraine. A lot of these bans, it should be said, are for the uh, NATO war against uh, Russia. And uh, I suppose that plays in here because Russia is a great supporter of Palestine or has been during the Gaza, uh, what's been happening in Gaza over the past few, uh, few months. So, yeah, culturally, it's destroyed. But, I mean, hopefully, given what we've seen from campus protests, although they've been broken in the United States to a certain extent, we were fearful, all of us, of another Kent State shooting. Such was the violence against uh, protesters uh, for Palestine. Uh, you know, the protests even, I mean, there's a big one in London, I understand, on Saturday. Uh, the cultural uh, power... Is that waning because of uh, social media? That's, of course, why they've gone for social media. That's why they we have Zuckerberg of Facebook desperately trying to um, be sycophantic, arguably, to Donald Trump, fearful that he might be arrested because, you know, things get through even on his platform meta that show the extent of the atrocities at the hands of uh, weapons from the military-industrial complex of NATO. Well, Pavel Durov's brother is now safely back in Russia, the owner of Rumble, successfully escaped from Europe uh, just ahead of what one must assume would have been the same fate as has befallen Pavel Durov. Uh, Durov must wish he was at least back in the United Arab Emirates or perhaps more safely in Russia itself. Are we all going to have to move to Russia? <laughs> I should say... The UAE has been uh, asking for consular access to the Telegram billionaire uh, founder, CEO, Pavel Durov, who lives here in, in Dubai, other, when he's not uh, uh, banned from leaving, the, leaving France, his other citizenship. If you look through Pavel Durov's uh, Telegram or Twitter or whatever, you'll find nothing he's ever said uh, for Julian Assange, nothing he's ever said for Gaza. They're not particularly uh, political, I suppose. We could be nice by saying... But uh, we don't really know his connections to uh, uh, Western sources. Some reports talking about French intelligence. These billionaires are frightened. So maybe Taylor Swift does have reason. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're powerful, whether you're powerless. Such is the power of the uh, military industrial complex that are making billions from public money as austerity bites and people can't afford to uh, eat or heat in Western Europe. They have an ability to censor. And uh, are they going to be banned in Western Europe? I mean, uh, just this week, there are a whole spate of cases against Google and Facebook. Who would have thought Google and Facebook, uh, Google, the CIA cutouts, both of them, are champions of free speech? They are, because even they can't stop the uh, the users 
the millions of users, hundreds of millions of users spreading information like, um, like uh, points of light in W.H. Auden's uh, words. It's uh, also the anniversary this week of the uh, outbreak of uh, World War II, if you ignore what was happening between China and Japan, uh, when Germany went into Poland. You know, these are points of light. You can't erase them. Everyone knows. But as for the people of Gaza, it doesn't look like uh, anyone's going to save uh, the remaining uh, millions left. Well, may the Lord preserve your points of light. Afshan Ratansi, thanks for joining us on Have It Out with Galloway. Wow, that was quite an interview. Let's go to the studio wall and see what's on the mind of our audience today. Zubair Rashid is a solicitor in Birmingham, in England. Zubair, welcome to the show. Hi, George. Thank you very much for inviting me over. My question, can you hear me, George? Yes, very clearly. Go ahead. Right. My question is to you. Why Zionist political violence and influence is so strong? And what are the main reasons behind them? And why world power like USA and other Western Europe seem to be supporting them directly or indirectly? Well, because we gave birth to the Israeli state, to the Zionist idea. The Zionist idea was born amongst U US Christian evangelicals. It was given a huge leap forward in London in the Balfour Declaration. It was given birth by the British mandate in Palestine, an imprimatur belatedly from the United Nations itself. Israel was created, the only state to ever have been created by a resolution of the United Nations. Nowadays, Israeli uh, diplomats openly call for the obliteration of the United Nations and its headquarters on the East River in New York. So it's uh, no surprise that the remaining posts of empire continue to support their own child because Israel is their child, an illegitimate child. There is another word for an illegitimate child, which I shan't use for reasons of taste. And they are determined not to abandon the child to which they gave birth. And they are determined to, if possible, outgun us with arguments. But if that fails, then simply to disarm us. And that's the kind of thing we've been talking about this evening. The disarming of critics of Israel. In the case of Sarah Wilkinson, in the most extreme way, forbidden to use a telephone in 2024, forbidden to use a computer in 2024, a journalist forbidden to communicate with anybody. That's worse than house arrest. At least under house arrest, you can send emails, but Sarah Wilkinson cannot. These are her bail conditions. If she breaches them, she'll end up behind bars. Can you imagine that we have reached this stage? Thanks uh, for that call from Birmingham. Let's go to London, where Nick Smith has a question. Nick, welcome. Oh, hiya. hiya, George. Hello, everyone. Hi. George, I just want to briefly talk about the Notting Hill Carnival, where 50 police officers were injured, 37 emergency workers were injured, over 100 drug offences, around 300 arrests, three guns seized and taken, 12 sexual assaults, eight stabbings, which have now led to two people dying. George, is it time we now cancel Notting Hill Carnival? Well, I used to live in the middle of what once a year was the Notting Hill Carnival. I say I used to live there. I used to move out of town when the Notting Hill Carnival came. So riotous an event had it become. And that's some years ago. Uh, so my answer to that would be that it cannot continue in its present form. We cannot possibly have people being murdered in broad daylight 
on the streets of the centre of London in the middle of a festival. Now, we have to keep this in perspective. The millions who attend the Notting Hill Carnival also have to be taken into account. The stabbings that occur every day far away from the Notting Hill Carnival have to be borne in mind. The truth is, we are in the middle of a crime wave in Britain that the government shows no signs at all of being in control of. Indeed, the government is preoccupied by sending 12 officers to arrest a 61-year-old lady uh, called Sarah Wilkinson for defending Palestine on, on the internet. Well, we can't continue with this crime wave. Poor people are stabbing poor people. Black people are stabbing black people. Uh, the drug uh, gangs are shooting people uh, in places that we never imagined would suffer from high rates of violent crime before. Bournemouth, uh, for example. Uh, home counties, towns that you would never figure would end up in a crime drama are now in the grip of real, real crime dramas. So we've got a critical problem in Britain. Our police are not up to dealing with it. They've been so savagely reduced in number. The number of police stations that have been closed and are now blocks of luxury flats uh, is legendary. <coughs> the police are at least 40,000 officers short. And some way is going to have to be found of uh, empowering special constables from amongst retired police officers, from amongst uh, uh, ex-military people, from amongst concerned citizenry for uh, use in specific occasions where the police are overwhelmed, the police are uh, pressed. But I never liked the Notting Hill Carnival. It cannot go on next year in the same way as it went on this year. Either it will have to be moved or some solution has to be found. Two entirely innocent people, one of them a mother in front of her young child, were murdered in broad daylight at a festival, at a carnival. And the number of attacks on emergency workers that you adumbrated there is completely unacceptable, and I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to deal with that matter. Let's go on to Alan Smith. I don't know where Alan is from. It's in Raleigh in the United States of America. Alan, most welcome. What would you like to say? George, a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, even with all, all, all this... Uh, going on in the media and you know you wake up every day uh, to hear some new atrocity in israel a new way of killing torturing people stealing land it just goes on and on and on there we are making some incremental progress i would say um you know um uh here in america bernie sanders uh, just uh put forth a resolution to delay the 20 million dollar arms sale to Israel. So that's, that's going to delay things at least. Uh, APAC had to spend um, $25 million to unseat just two progressives in the House. They were afraid to uh, go after the rest of them who were pro-Palestinian. Also, a total of 150 members of uh, the U.S. Congress, that is senators and members of the U.S. House, uh, boycotted Bibi's speech before Congress recently. So, you know, Two years ago, I think uh, all that would have been unthinkable. And it, and it certainly isn't enough with everything that's going on, and we need to do more. Uh, but but I, I do think we are making some progress. Well, I think, Don't you think? Uh, that the, the jury's out on my question at the beginning of the show. Is Israel's power growing or is it on the way? And you have provided some, as it were, countervailing argument as to the incremental progress that we have made. And uh, that's welcome, I have no doubt. Afshin Ratansi seemed to be of the view, I think I am myself of the view, 
that the jury's still out. It's easy to oversell the extent to which the demonstrations, the protests, the tweets, the Facebook posts, and so on, indicate a loss of Israeli power. And it's true that they have lost. But on the other hand, they're culturally still dominant amongst artists, for example. Uh, amongst uh, the uh, politicians, that's not even an argument. The politicians in the Western world are bought and paid for and have no intention of breaking their contract with Israel. APAC that you mentioned boasted in August that they had spent $100 million already on the current cycle of American elections. They talk about Russian interference, Chinese interference, Iranian interference. $100 million by August. The elections are not until November has been spent by what is effectively the mouthpiece of a foreign power, although uniquely one that is not required to register as a, a foreign agent. But $100 million bought them success. They boast that every single candidate that they supported in the primaries, every one was successful in their primary election. So I can say virtually every congressperson in the United States is a paid agent of the Netanyahu apartheid state. That tells you we've still got a long way to go. Let's try Norman McKenzie again. I think we may have solved the muting problem. Norman, welcome. Hello, George. Hi. Very good to speak to you this Thank afternoon. You. Um, a couple of months ago, I set up, while there still was a, a Tory government, uh, Ofcom Watch, which is an organization that is looking to provide some oversight on Ofcom, the, the Orwellian named Office of Communications in the UK that is regulating, or as I like to say, is censoring uh, TV and radio content. But now, under, under the Labour government, the, the powers of Ofcom are actually going to be extended um, under legislation to embrace the internet and, and social media. And we are going to see, I think, um, more sweeping censorship powers and restrictions of free speech using that Online Safety Act. Is that something that you support or, or would you support our, would you endorse and support our campaign? Uh, well, I, I need to see your campaign's details, but on the face of it, I wholly support you. Who will guard the guards is an ancient question. Uh, who will monitor the Ofcom monitors of uh, output? I could show you my scars of previous conflicts with them myself. But the truly nightmarish proposition is the one you pose, that the uh, the purview of Ofcom is to be extended onto the Internet. The Internet's whole point was that it was free. Uh, but if the state is going to seek to intervene on what can be said or even heard uh, by British people, well, first of all, that's going to lead to a big spike in VPNs. Uh, I'm getting a new VPN and pretending I'm in Brazil uh, for reasons which the cognoscenti will immediately grasp. Uh, but the nightmare will be if Ofcom seeks to interfere in the output of someone like me, uh, for example. Someone with an audience of several millions, sometimes four millions in a single week. Are they going to try and interfere in what I say? or interfere in the people that can hear me. That's why I made the joke with Afshan earlier, do we all have to move to Russia? Uh, imagine, they used to tell us Russia was a prison state and we were the free world. Now it's actually a debatable point whether you'd be freer in Russia to speak out than you are in the so-called free world, rocking in the free world. 
I'll look up your uh, Ofcom watch. I'd like to be able to support you. Thanks, uh, Norman, for that. Jake Fern is an artist in Brighton. Jake, welcome. Hello, George. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good to be on. I just, I'm, I'm just thinking more sort of theoretically, philosophically about the whole thing. Mm. One question is, do we think in this country, particularly in the UK, that people who have legitimate concerns about unlimited immigration are being drawn into this kind of Zionist mindset? And is that a false paradigm? Well, it's ironic, of course, because uh, Zionism depends upon mass immigration uh, of Jews from around the world, from the countries in which they were born. Their fathers, grandfathers, great, 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 great grandfathers were born. Mass immigration is the whole shtick of Zionism and going to take over somebody else's land, somebody else's country. So it's ironic, but yes, uh, if you were drawing a Venn diagram, you'd have a very large overlap between the opponents, the most aggressive uh, opponents of migration uh, and the supporters of Israel. Partly that's a function of the money that's being paid out. Uh, little Tommy Robinson, not his real name, uh, but his stage name, uh, has been paid a lot of money by the Israel lobby, and that's one of the reasons why he shoots the breeze for them. But you're right. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, political currents or trends uh, that uh, see these two things as synonymous, uh, opposing Muslims, because that's what they really hate, uh, and, uh, and supporting Israel killing Muslims and Christians, of course, in occupied Palestine. There is a Venn diagram, there is an overlap uh, between these two things, but it isn't a necessary one. I, myself, am against mass immigration. Uh, Sarah Wagenknecht, who did so well in the regional election uh, in uh, Germany yesterday, uh, who, who got nearly 15% of the vote, she, like me, is opposed to mass immigration, and for the same reasons that Mass immigration beggars the countries that the migrants are leaving from and, in a capitalist society, places unbearable uh, stresses on the poorest and the working class in the countries to which they come. I say that openly here in Britain, uh, although I'm from a socialist tradition. She does the same in Germany. Uh, I like to think that one day we'll be as successful as her. Uh, the, the reality is there's nothing left wing about mass immigration. In fact, it's the opposite of left wing. The only people in favor of mass immigration, of open borders, uh, are, are the, the, the billionaire class who get the cheap labor and misguided liberals and anarchists about whom uh, I'll talk another time. Thanks very much for that call. Let me go to Lahore in Pakistan, where Muhammad Mahad Samija is there. Muhammad, welcome uh, back to the show. Nice Hello. to uh, see you again. Sorry about last week. What would you like to say? Assalamu alaikum, George. Can you hear me properly? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Very loud and clear. Uh, sir, uh, basically, I have. Uh, I want to thank you for what you did for Palestine and what you did for Pakistan. And now I want to ask you that uh, why China and Russia does not deploy peacekeeping forces in the Gaza Strip and ask uh, Netanyahu. Uh, look, Mr. Bibi, no, not a single bomb. Don't you dare to uh, bombard any building, any refugee camp, because we are going to deploy peacekeeping forces according to the mandate of the United Nations. So uh, why Russia and China cannot do this? And how Israel's apartheid regime can be stopped 
as it has expanded its carnage towards the West Bank. Well, uh, I guess the reason why they're not doing that is uh, they think that it's not the right time for World War III uh, because that's what that would entail uh, if uh, Russian and Chinese forces interposed themselves in the occupied uh, territories. Uh, that would be uh, a breach of international law. They have no UN mandate to do that and the United States would presumably come to Israel's aid. Uh, so uh, we're, I suppose, lucky uh, that they have not done that. I've argued, uh, it's unpopular in some quarters, I've argued that there are many things that they could do short of that. And I talked in a recent show here uh, about why they don't sail a hospital ship into the bay in Gaza and say, invite the cameras uh, to make it clear this is merely a hospital ship and we are here to help the humanitarian catastrophe that is occurring in the Gaza Strip. And we defy the Israeli government to fire upon a Russian or Chinese or both hospital ships. I think that that could have been done should have been done, would have been a sign of intent, would have been an escalation, but an entirely justified one. Justified in pursuit of the mandate of the International Court of Justice. As to what can be done, uh, of course, we're doing everything that we can, but it is not enough. Your government is supporting Israel. My government in Britain is supporting Netanyahu. The American government, most of all, is supporting it. Until we reach a stage where politicians know that it will cost them many more votes than it would ever gain them to support Israel and its crimes, I fear that our governments are going to continue doing what they have been doing. Doing. Thanks for the call in Lahore. Let's go to Addis Ababa, where Derej Yemeru has a point of view. Derej, welcome. Good evening, George. Good Good evening, brother. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Israel is slaughtering these Gaza children, uh, yet somehow the they are able to get uh, vaccinated. Uh, why do you think uh, they are saving these children before their bombs kill them? Uh, well, it is, uh, time, yeah, is, uh, it is grotesque. It is grotesque, I'll grant you, to have a three-day pause, which hasn't actually even happened yet, uh, to inoculate children against polio, and then at the end of three days uh, to begin killing them uh, from the air and land and sea all over again. At least the child will have been vaccinated against polio. It wasn't Israel's idea uh, to inoculate the children against polio, but the emergence of polio in Gaza is not just a mortal threat to the Palestinian kids there, uh, but also, of course, the spores of polio are not restricted by barbed wire. They're not restricted by borders or by names of places. Uh, Polio can spread into uh, the apartheid state itself. So that's why they agreed to it when the World Health Organization proposed it. Uh, And uh, I lived in the time of polio, by the way. Lots of children around me in the 1950s in, uh, in Britain Uh, wore metal calipers on their legs, were confined to wheelchairs, the most extreme, living out their lives, lying flat on a bed in what was called an iron lung. The horrors of polio uh, should not be uh, underestimated. I was injected and got a sugar lump, uh, which kept me safe from polio, and we must be grateful for the small mercy that kids in Gaza are going to be 
inoculated against it. The last call, I, I think I can safely say, is Malik Naim in Germany, where big events happened this week. Malik, welcome to the show. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Galloway. Um, in this gloomy and devastating time, you provide a pole uh, of security and positivity for many people. And you remind me of, uh, of the lighthouse in the ocean with turbulent water. I want to speak about another problem, which is quite so old as Palestine problem. And this is Kashmir. And in Kashmir it has been turned into open air prison for four years now. And Indian and, and Israelis are working together and learning from each other how to keep these people under control and uh, punish them and do all kinds of crimes. Um, the whole world reminds me of, at the moment, of Pakistan, this, which has a population of 250 million. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but about half a million soldiers and about a million um, police, pe police, uh, police personnel. And they are demonstrating like we're doing here in Europe, but nothing is happening. And there is our I prime know, minister, Imran I know, Khan. As I you know, know, Malik, uh, just for uh, the clock, because I have to wrap up now, I'm intervening in the most important issue that you raised, which is very close to my heart. I have the two highest civil awards in Pakistan, the Halali Kadiazam, the Halali Pakistan, the latter was for my work on Kashmir. I have spoken many times about Kashmir. The speeches are available on the internet, but it's entirely correct that you bring up the fact that the people of held Kashmir are under the jackboot of military occupation in exactly the same way that the Palestinian people are, and for almost exactly the same amount of time. Imagine. And there was a common denominator between both Kashmir and Palestine. Both are blunders and crimes of the British Empire. It was Britain that in its cack-handed handling of awarding independence to India and the subsequent partition of the country and allowing Maharajas to declare where their territory that they owned would be placed as between India and Pakistan. And it was Britain through the Balfour Declaration and through the British Mandate, which is responsible as the midwife of the entire Palestinian Nakba. I commend my speeches in the House and online on Kashmir to you, Malik. I'm grateful even for the few minutes that you were able to talk about it. Back to the subject of the program. I think we can safely conclude that it is not safe to conclude that Israel's power is either growing or on the wane. As I put it earlier, the jury is still out. But the difference on this between real life and a jury is we are allowed to persuade others by any means, whether it's standing on a soapbox, which I will do if necessary, without a microphone, a megaphone, if you take it away. By any means whatsoever, we should be trying to persuade our fellow citizens wherever we are, not just to stand with Palestine, but to convey a message that we will never stop standing with Palestine until Palestine is free. It's been marvelous. Hope you enjoyed it. If so, come back next week at the same time or have it out with Galloway.